Okay, it's my pleasure to introduce our, our next speaker, Shane Pierce. She's an associate professor of biomedical engineering and associate pr professor of ophthalmology at the University of Virginia. She's also a, mem a member of their cardiovascular research center uh, and associate director of their cardiovascular training grant. Uh, she got her BS in biomedical engineering and in engineering mechanics from Johns Hopkins University and her PhD in biomedical uh, engineering at the University of Virginia. Her lab uses ex experimental and computational techniques to study uh, and design new approaches for growing and regenerating injured and diseased tissues, uh, has research interests in systems level investigation of these processes, inflammatory cell, uh, circulating cell progenitor cell homing, for example, and atherosclerosis, uses multi-scale computational modeling. You may recall that I used a slide from a recent review in my overview early on, on Monday, maybe we'll see that same slide uh, today as part of her presentation. Uh, and the title of her presentation is Multi-Scale Model Models for Understanding Regulators of Tissue Growth and Remodeling. Shane? Thank you for that nice introduction. Um, so we're going to switch gears a little bit and focus on blood vessels. So allow me that. I do have a video of a monocyte rolling inside a blood vessel to kind of give a little bit of street cred to the fact that occasionally I really pay attention to the immune system. Um, but I'm going to focus this talk mostly on growth and remodeling, which obviously implicates the immune system. But we're really going to be looking at the vascular structures, principally the endothelial cells that line all of the blood vessels in our body. I'm going to be talking about um, both small vessel remodeling, so the microcirculation, how patterns of networks of blood vessels, the smallest scale, 10, 20, 30 microns, adapt and remodel and grow, principally during development. And then about halfway through my talk, I'm going to switch to uh, talking about large blood vessels, so talking about remodeling of coronary arteries, for example, um, enlargement due to uh, sustained pressure increases that would occur during hypertension. Uh, for example. So we're going to talk about blood vessels. Um, obviously, when we think about growth and remodeling, um, not to state the obvious, but these processes really span length scales and they're very dynamic, changing over time. So if we look at just the structure of the blood vessels of our body, the circulation, it's very beautifully organized. And as you sort of zoom in with your microscope, and this is something you do a lot, you can really begin to appreciate that different length scales, you get interesting patterns. And these patterns are both uh, evidence of different functions that are occurring, but also sort of illustrative or suggestive of how their formation might have come about as a result of biochemical signals or electrical signals or even mechanical signals. So as we zoom in, uh, we begin to see sort of these structures, which are obviously blood vessels kind of resolve themselves at the cell level, uh, even a single cell level, and really it's this sort of back and forth kind of traversing these length scales, the interplay uh, that weaves in and out, um, lower levels of scale affecting higher levels of scale, and then vice versa, that gives rise to adaptation in um, our tissues, and specifically uh, the vascular network. This is the video I promised. So these are monocytes rolling inside of a post-capillary venule and skin that we've made movies of. So again, just to illustrate the point that these processes are dynamic and do involve uh, the recruitment of cells and their um, sort of history, time history as they traverse through the body and then set up shop and grow new patterns of tissues. So this is a movie uh, that I borrowed from my collaborator down at UNC Chapel Hill, Vicki Bouch. Um, she has a really neat in vitro system where she can study and, and, and make these movies of um, vasculogenesis or the growth of new blood vessel uh, patterns in embryonic tissues. These are uh, em embryonic stem cells that have been obtained from a blastocyst stage embryo and they spontaneously differentiate into endothelial cells which we're visualizing here using GFP that's driven by an endothelial specific promoter, PCAM. And one thing that you can appreciate if you watch a lot of these videos uh, is that really the cells, it's the cells that are kind of responding um, we think, to their environment and probably to one another too. And as that environment changes over time, and even in this one video, if you focus, and I'm sure you're doing it now, looking at the sort of similarities and differences between the orange highlighted boxes, 
even in the close vicinity of one another, you see these two sprouts behaving quite differently, or these sprouting regions. So here you see a sprout that's rel uh, relatively uh, persistent, right? It strikes out on its own, and it sort of continues out, and it's looking and searching and looking for friends. And then down here, just you know, in an adjacent region of the tissue, you, you see two sprouts that kind of come together. They, they burgeon out from their parent vessel. They sort of touch, but then they, for one, other, one reason or another, decide they don't like each other and sort of regress, right? So these are very different cell behaviors in the same tissue, but ultimately the ramifications at higher levels of scale could lead to whether or not a blood vessel forms in this location or in, in that location. Uh, so, you know, how do we study this? What, what can we do to sort of make sense of this, obviously? I think the answer there is, um, let's look and see what models can do for us. And when we think about uh, cell behaviors, um, it's, it's kind of natural, I think, to, to sort of tie in the emergent effects that cell behaviors on the individual scale could have as they um, sort of propagate upward. So looking at endothelial cells interacting with their neighbors and with their immediately local environment, how does that then scale up at the network level to produce these really interesting and you know, functionally relevant and important patterns of blood vessel networks? Um, an analogy I like to use, other people um, use this idea who study, or use this sort of metaphor who study emergence, is the idea if you look at one species of bird, say Canadian geese, for example, you know, if you, if you just look at that one bird, it might have sort of behaviors on its own level of scale that are important when it's flying together with its flock, right, where you get this sort of emergent higher level pattern, which in the case of Canadian geese, of course, is this V-shaped flying formation. Uh, so I think a natural way to look at this concept of emergence individual behaviors sort of propagating up to higher levels of scale is to use agent-based modeling. And that's really where I've spent a lot of my time in terms of trying to um, develop new ways to apply agent-based models to these sorts of questions where emergent behavior is really the, the theme. And I know you guys had a, you know, a couple classes on this, so I won't belabor sort of how it works. But just for example, um, this sort of schematic is kind of representative of the types of things agent-based models can do in the context of studying biological processes. Uh, so you can have sort of a, a, a far field effect, a growth factor, say for example, being secreted that sort of diffuses through an environment and obviously you get sort of spatial heterogeneities in that environment as a result of diffusion. Then you can have that in turn affecting sort of the environmental change could affect the behavior of an agent, or in this case, we model them as sort of you know, single cells represent our agents. In response, you could have rules, right, we typically do, that govern some, again, sort of phenotypic response, like chemotaxis, this would be sort of the classical case of, you know, an endothelial cell uh, proliferating, migrating in response to a growth factor, of course, mitosis. And then um, you can also have sort of ramification or apoptosis of, uh, of a blood vessel network as a result of that behavior. So the idea is, again, very simply, that we're representing individual cells, sort of biological analogs as agents, and they can exhibit the same behaviors that you know, we classically think of them exhibiting in vivo, and then sort of put together in space and time with rules governing what behaviors happen when, we can sort of reproduce these emergent outcomes, or in this case, sort of the growth of a new blood vessel. Um, so I think agent-based models, uh, in addition to just kind of being, you know, an interesting way to look at multi-cell events within a tissue as it remodels, um, are also nicely um, positioned to serve a role in multi-scale modeling. Um, and I've sort of came up with this taxonomy um, with my student Joe, who's a lot of uh, a lot of the work today I'll show is is, is, is his work. Um, but also in collaboration with Jason Pappen at the University of Virginia. And we were trying to sort of compartmentalize or, or classify, I guess, categorize um, the types of multi-scale models that are sort of out there in the literature. And I think it's easy you know, to see or appreciate that the, the word multi-scale modeling is thrown around quite a bit. Um, and I think rightfully so. There's just a lot of flavors of multi-scale. So our attempt to sort of define the different flavors is represented on the slide. So sort of starting over here at the left, um, sort of one uh, representation of a multi-scale model is sort of an implicitly multi-scale model where you can have a number of different inputs to a model. Um, and each of those inputs, parameters, 
uh, initial conditions, variables, what have you, could come from different levels of biological scale. So you might have inputs that are based on gene expression, inputs that are based on in vitro assays, inputs that are based on mouse knockout models, and they all kind of go into you know, a single model that gives an output. Um, and again, these are sort of, we call them single stream or sort of implicitly multi-scale models. Um, the sort of next level up, so to speak, is if you have a, a model that's sort of connected um, to other models, but in a very um, sort of series kind of way. So there's not feedback between the levels of scale, but there's just an input at one level of scale, gives a prediction maybe at an out, uh, a different level of scale. That output or prediction is then fed into a different model. And this might even be, you can think of it as sort of like different graduate students in the lab. You have one doing sort of the ODE model and it's predicting say, you know, activation levels of a receptor over time, and then that data is sort of either formally or maybe informally informing a different level of scale model and so on and so forth, but sort of um, dis disconnected, decoupled. It's still absolutely multi-scale, but the scales aren't feeding back on one another. So obviously that leads us to sort of the next type of multi-scale model that we've seen and people are developing, and this is where you have sort of two simulations one maybe at the intracellular level of scale and one at maybe the you know, multicellular level of scale. And they're receiving you know, different inputs and then making predictions at, you know, at the, the relevant output for their levels, for their particular, the relevant scale for their particular output. But then that is getting fed back into the other models. So you get this sort of crisscross, this sort of you know, actually truly feeding data from one level of scale in, predicting out another level of scale, and that goes back to a different model. Um, I would say these models are um, becoming more prevalent. Uh, they require a lot more computing power. It's where we spend a lot of our time, and I'm going to really be talking about um, these types of models, sort of the idealized or the, you know, the most multi-scale, multi-scale types of models are shown and represented over here on the far right. And this is where you have that same sort of integration, but instead of it have, instead of the integration between the outputs and the inputs of the different level of scale models happening sort of just once or twice, you have much more iterative feedback. And I think this is kind of the holy grail for multi-scale models. Um, but I would also say that in many senses, you know, we still have some serious uh, conceptual uh, and computational challenges to, to achieving that. Um, but I think this is definitely the direction that the field is moving in. Um, so our efforts at classifying here these sort of different types of multi-scale models um, are by no means meant to sort of um, put some sort of weighting or uh, pre preference um, as to uh, which models are better. I think they're all useful. All of these multi-scale models, or however you use the word multi-scale, is useful and ultimately um, sort of driving forward questions that without models wouldn't even be thinkable um, in terms of addressing. So they're all good, is my point. This is just a way to think about how these models sort of um, fit in. Uh, okay, so I have to talk a little bit now about the biology of angiogenesis. And um, what I'm going to tell you is really sort of embarrassingly simplified for someone who's supposed to be talking about systems biology. It's kind of, um, I guess, a, a paradox, really. We've decided that as we develop complicated multi-scale models, we need to really simplify as much as possible, at least at the beginning, so that what we come up with can be computationally tractable, and so we can make sure we sort of get it right at the smaller scale before moving up into bigger scales. So I'm going to tell you about a couple cell behaviors, principally uh, migration and a little bit of proliferation, um, but, but mostly just how do cells, when they're next to each other, talk to one another. Um, so there's not a lot of interesting sort of cell biology going on, and there's not a lot of interesting molecular biology that we're considering either. Um, but again, the point is sometimes when you start out to do something new like we are here, we want to take a very simple case, make sure we get it right, with the idea that ultimately we'll scale up. So here's again, this is the embryoid body. We just watched a movie of this sort of um, evolving into a vascular network over time. And you can see I've highlighted here in this box a you know, endothelial cell that sort of looks like it's going to be sprouting. So the field has sort of denoted um, this behavior uh, according to how the cells are associated with one another. So we have tip cells, and they're the ones that you know, have received the magic signal to start migrating out. And then we have these stalk cells, which are the neighboring cells that juxtapose the tip cells. 
and we think there's a really interesting balance here of stimulatory factors and inhibitory factors that are governing these behaviors uh, within the local environment of, say, these three cells. So the um, obvious, uh, most obvious stimulatory behavior, the one we know the most about, is vascular endothelial growth factor. So that's definitely something that we're going to put in our very simplified model. Um, and just a little bit about the biology. VEGF binds uh, VEGF receptor 2, um, which in this you know, um, sort of tip cell, stalk cell orientation is thought to be upregulated on the tip cell. Uh, that in turn um, actually causes upregulation of DLL4 which is a, a protein that is expressed at the interface between the tip cell and the stalk cells. Uh, that ligates notch on a neighboring cell, which is then cleaved with gamma sarcotase in the neighboring cell, translates to the nucleus, uh, activates a number of transcription factors, which then um, cause, to the ex uh, cause the expression of VEGF R1, which is a decoy receptor, interestingly, for VEGF. So it's actually in this way, and I should also mention there's a, a soluble form of VEGF R2, which we think are hypothesized and sort of secreted out in the environment, which further amplifies sort of the sink for VEGF that prevents activation of VEGF R2 and sprouting behaviors in the adjacent cells, right? So the basic idea is we wouldn't want all of our endothelial cells to sprout every time they see VEGF. If we want to get patterns where only certain endothelial cells get activated to sprout so that we can get organized branches, it behooves the system to have some sort of inhibition so that not every single endothelial cell that sees VEGF can sprout. So it's pretty basic, again, highly simplified um, version of the biology, but it's what we chose to tackle first uh, in our model. And really what we were interested in is sort of the, this push and pull. So one question we had is, what is the critical VEGF gradient that a cell needs to sprout? And then how much lateral inhibition is necessary sort of at these interconnections between the tips and the stalk cells to generate sort of a properly formed vascular network? And importantly, which of these two factors, the stimulatory or the inhibitory, has more pull in the system, is more influential in the system? So again, kind of a stripped down question, is it the stimulatory factor, the VEGF that's really pulling the tip out, or is it the inhibition that drives this sort of organized sprouting phenotype that we see in a developing blood vessel network? Okay, so one of the neat things about agent-based models, specifically when you're using them to look at multi-cell phenomena, is that you can very explicitly represent initial geometries at sort of time zero. Um, so the, the sprouting behavior that we're observing in these uh, videos um, that Vicky provides us is sort of over four hours. So this would be sort of the picture at, at our T0, and we can kind of discretize the uh, network and then represent, again, each cell as an individual agent. Um, so here you can see this would be a cell, it's sort of, you get this sort of nucleus is shown in red with these cytoskeletal kind of representing struts that are connecting to the blue membrane elements, which represents the borders of each cell. Um, the, the, I think, thing that is sort of the innovation here that makes this what I would say truly a, a multi-scale model, it's probably more of the type 2 version that I mentioned earlier than the type 3, although of course that's where we want to head, is that we have agent behaviors, um, or excuse me, cell behaviors being represented by the individual agents, but then we also have a PDE OD model, ODE model that is sort of calculating diffusion and the kinetics of receptor ligand binding of soluble factors over time, right? So we have these two models and they're you know, sort of going to be working together. Um, just a little bit about the models. Again, they're quite simple for us. Agent-based models can have any number of rules. In this case, we only have 19. Um, they're mostly all liter well, actually, they're mostly literature derived, with the exception of a few. Um, we have a couple parameters that are free parameters, which we end up having to specify based on experimental data, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so we have sort of production rates of VEGFR2, um, and that's a function of how much um, activated notch there is in that cell. Um, we have this sort of scaling coefficient, uh, which we have to incorporate so that our models can play nicely together, so it can kind of work with the PDE-ODE model. Um, that's something that we found as we try to couple these different models at different length scales that, you know, sometimes they don't always agree, uh, and so you have to do some sort of force fitting, and I'll get into that a little bit more in the next section of my talk. 
Um, we have a, a rate constant for notch activation, and then we also have a degradation constant for notch activation. Um, and importantly, this is going to be uh, one of the free parameters that we're going to vary in the sensitivity analysis that I'll show you in a few slides, where we're trying to sort of approximate, because it's something that you can't really measure empirically, um, how much uh, DLL4 activation there has to be in order to um, induce, or how much notch activation there has to be in order to induce DLL4. Um, we have in our ODE model, PD ODE model, and this is the model that's really there to help try to help us sort of in a, I guess, a physically relevant way approximate the concentrations of growth factors. VEGF obviously is the one that we're using right now, but in, you know, spatially throughout the model. Um, this is work that's done in collaboration with Phelan McGowan at uh, Johns Hopkins, who's developed a lot of these types of models with a very um, fine degree of detail to try to understand receptor lagging kinetics at the surface, surface of individual cells. So we're sort of trying to you know, capitalize on his expertise and really um, use that sort of fine grain um, appreciation for what the receptor activation is on every individual cell, but then let that affect the global cell behaviors in the agent-based model. So this is sort of standard as um, probably things that you learned about this week. You have you know, production rates over time to govern uh, protein transport. Of course, there's sort of a diffusion uh, component as this uh, uh, growth factor diffuses over, over that space. We have reversible binding of the growth factor to an extracellular matrix and to the membrane receptors. Of course, we're going to have a degradation term. Um, we also have the cell surface of the, um, the cell surface receptor level expression is governed by ODEs. So they have sort of an insertion rate into the membrane. There's also receptor internalization and, of course, ligand binding um, and dimerization as well. I should mention that, that these um, receptors are dimers. Uh, so how does this come together? As I said, we sort of have this agent-based model to look at cell behaviors, but then we also have this more fine-grained model at the molecular level to look at how ligands and receptors bind one another on the surface of individual cells. So how do we really bring them together? And that's kind of represented here. So um, we have you know, a little bit of stochasticity governing um, where these cells can go and how they respond. They sort of update their, their shape change. Um, that, in turn, will affect uh, the VEGF diffusion, so it sort of changes the space for VEGF to diffuse in, and also, obviously, the amount of receptor activation on the surface of any given cell. That, in turn, in the PDE and ODE model, is fed back into the agent-based model, and so VEGF binding, as I've already said, can affect things like uh, ex expression of notch and then expression of the other decoy receptor. Um, and so we get sort of this cyclic thing going on, sort of feeding back, it takes about three days to run. <laughs> it's really computationally intensive. Um, and so we've had to make some simplification steps along the way. Um, but for the most part, we have you know, these, these models. It's sort of two different levels of scale, more or less working together. Um, of course, we want to interface this with the biology. So we have, you know, as I mentioned before, our T0 starting configuration, or starting initial configuration of our um, embryoid body vascular plexus. And you know, thanks to Vicky and her lovely confocal microscopy movies, we can get sort of you know time points, and we can watch and see which of our cells are actually becoming these tip cells and starting to form sprouts, and how does that behavior change over time? Uh, we're predicting the same sort of events in the model, and then there's a nice way to do validation by uh, comparing analogous outputs, which in our case, the ones I'm going to focus on today are comparing the number of sprouts that form over a four-hour period, and also the location. So how many sprouts form, and where are they in the network? Which of those um, endothelial cells sort of get um, triggered to go out and do the thing of forming a new blood vessel? So here's Vicki, again, just to acknowledge her. Uh, there's Phelan, and then this is Joe. And so it's really a nice sort of three-way collaboration that's bringing together the two models in the context of this dynamic data that Vicki's able to provide. Um, so this is uh, just a small window of one of the embryoid bodies. Um, we've again represented that as our agent base in our agent based model, and you can see here's just a little screenshot, a little movie of the cells that are. Um, can't see the growth factor here, but the cells are sort of going out and you know sniffing around to um, see what the VEGF environment is like, and that in turn is having an effect on how much they're able to sort of communicate with their neighbor in terms of becoming a, a tip cell or not. 
Um, the main predictions we get, as I said in the, in the previous slide, are sprout frequency and sprout location. Um, I'll tell you one of these is, is much easier to predict than the other, and you can probably guess which one that is. Um, in terms of sprout location, we've sort of um, broken down the output into the true positives. So this is a case represented in green, where within a certain radius, like a one cell radius, our model actually predicted where one of the sprouts was going to form. And then also we have, of course, false positives. And this is the instance where our model said that there was going to be a sprout there, but there really wasn't, right? And so we can kind of grade how the validity of our model based on its ability um, to sort of maximize the true positives and minimize the false positives. So as I mentioned before, there's an important free parameter that we wanted to um, fit because it is not something that has been measured. Uh, experimentally, and that is the relationship of this DLL4 to notch. Uh, and so in our model before, I think it was represented as alpha in the agent-based model, if you remember that slide a few, a few slides back. Um, so we took three of our movies and we used it, them as sort of the, the training set, if you will. Um, we varied this coefficient um, from basically zero all the way up to two, and then we can plot um, the actual number of sprouts for each of these three movies, embryoid body movies. And what struck us is they all kind of clustered around 0.6. Uh, so then using that, setting that coefficient, that, that parameter in the model to 0.6, we then wanted to see if we could predict uh, the remaining movies um, on our hard drive. And it turns out that um, the actual number of sprouts here shown in red, the, the sprouts that were counted down in North Carolina, um, were represented pretty nicely by, um, by our agent-based um, PDE model, with the exception of this last movie. I don't know what happened here. Obviously, our movie um, under-predicted the actual number of sprouts there. But you know, in all the other movies, we were pretty good when we fit uh, this parameter to this value. Um, so uh, one of the things that we're always tempted to do is, um, or I guess it makes sense, is to do sensitivity analyses on our model, right? Um, so moving forward, after we sort of confirm that we have sort of an ability to at least predict sprout numbers, uh, how does this vary again um, when we alter uh, the effect of the VEGF as compared to altering the effect of this inhibitor inhibitory stimulus, right? So back to the original question that I posed at the beginning, what's more important? Is it sort of the pulling force of the VEGF? or sort of the inhibition, the lateral inhibition that's provided by that tip cell to its neighbors in terms of getting a properly patterned network. Um, so there's a lot of data here and it's not presented particularly well, which is a tangent we're gonna take in a minute to talk about how we're trying to resolve that. Um, but basically here's a movie, just one of our movies. Um, you can see this is the initial condition. And in this particular movie, over four hours, uh, there were five, uh, cells that exhibited this sort of I'm a sprout, you know, tip cell behavior. Um, so we did this bivariate sensitivity analysis where we varied both the DLL4 notch, the inhibition, and the VEGF gradient um, that was required for a sprout to happen. And one thing that you can see is at um, very high, um, excuse me, very low levels of DLL4 notch inhibition, we get a lot of sprouting, which is completely what you would expect. We basically turn off the inhibition, and that's what's represented by the blue line. And at that point, it doesn't matter um, how much we change the gradient of VEGF in order to um, induce sprouting, we get the same amount. Um, but what you can see is that um, as we sort of introduce levels of inhibition, um, and, and in, basically increase this parameter in our sensitivity analysis, moving from the blue down to this sort of purple color, um, we are able to very quickly sort of, you know, get the right number of sprouts or tip cells being identified or predicted by our model. Um, and so sort of for all of these uh, levels, the, the purple, the blue, the orange, light blue, for these five levels of DLL4 notch, we're able to, just by, you know, adjusting the VEGF gradient threshold, sort of resolve or reproduce the number of sprouts that were observed in the experimental model. Now the same data plotted differently, just sort of you know switching the, the axis for the lines here. We're showing, um, again, that with VEGF threshold, as we uh, increase um, sort of this threshold required for sprouting, we actually can kind of 
if you compare the red here to say the, this purple color, we can, we can sort of tamp down on the, um, the um, inhibition, or I should say we, we can um, tamp down on that, um, uh, um, I'm getting confused here, by increasing the VEGF uh, threshold, we can slow down the amount of sprouting that happens. But what's interesting is that that's not nearly as strong of an influence as changing this notch delta coefficient, right? So we get a much more drastic effect by um, sort of increasing the inhibition. We get a much steeper slope here than we did here, which basically um, means that we're thinking about this kind of like on a microscope with the coarse grain and the fine grain focus. So we're sort of thinking about this inhibitory uh, stimulus as really the coarse grain, right? Because you, by changing it a little bit, you get you get a very big change in the amount of sprouting that's going on. But then by changing the fine grain focus, which is this this VEGF gradient th uh, threshold, you can actually sort of dial in just the right amount of sprouting. So that's kind of how we're thinking about it. Um, obviously, these are just predictions based on these two sort of influences that we've represented very simply using VEGF and then Notch. Um, but I think that's one of the neat things that you know models can do is they can allow you to fiddle around with the parameters and sort of explore uh, global sensitivity um, as it relates to you know the important behaviors that you care about. In our case, when do we get new sprouts? Um, now I'm going to uh, step off track for a minute and talk about um, something that's come out of a really interesting collaboration, and that is um, as soon as we started. Uh, doing these multivariate sensitivity analyses, we, we started generating graphs like crazy, and we didn't have the tools to really present them in a way that was able to allow us to draw any you know, meaningful insight. Um, and so one of the things that UVA faculty are really jealous about um, Virginia Tech is that you guys have a veterinary school, mm -hmm. and um, we don't have one of those. I love one, especially now that I have a project ongoing in my lab that um, the best model is a horse. Um, so, <laughs> strong, woefully deficient up there in Charlottesville with regards to that. But one of the things we do have that comes in handy occasionally is an architecture school. So we started collaborating with architects because if there's one thing architects are good at, it's taking a lot of information and sort of pictorially displaying it visually in a way that allows you to glean insight very quickly. Um, so this was sort of us before we met the architects and we were kind of left with this, um, you know, lovely colored grass, but really not a way to you know, ab abstract or, or draw any conclusions. The architects introduced us to something called parallel coordinates. Uh, it's just a different way to represent the same data that you saw on the previous slide with sort of the ugly line graphs. Um, maybe this isn't any prettier, but one of the things it does is it allows us to sort of present the uh, sensit by bivariate sensitivity analysis. We're varying two different parameters at the same time, the VEGF threshold and the notch threshold and plot those on sort of, you know, spanning two axes and then show the, the actual number of sprouts and then the standard deviation for each of the simulations. Now this is just one movie, and again, it's just the line graphs you saw previously plotted a different way. But what's neat, as I told you before, we have eight or nine movies and we're collecting more every day. And so if we want to compare across movies, this sort of, you know, bivariate sensitivity analysis, it's nice to have a fingerprinting method. So what the architects have helped us do is sort of come up with a way to sort of fingerprint these different sensitivity analyses. So very quickly you can stand back and, and look at this mode of representing multivariate data in a way that says, okay, these three are kind of the same, right? These three movies are the same and, and these, these two movies are clearly different from one another and, and also from, from the three below. Um, so again, I guess this is just a word of caution for those of you who are, you know, entering this multi-scale modeling um, space. There's a lot of times where you get a lot of data, and then it's hard to, you know, figure out what to do with it or how to even visualize it. Um, obviously, there's a number of data reduction techniques. Doug talked about one earlier, principal, comp principal component analysis, that can, that can be very helpful. But also, sometimes you just want to look at your data and just see it. And so I would throw this out there, the parallel coordinate scheme um, is kind of a nice way to, to create these fingerprints if you're going to do a, a multi-dimensional um, sensitivity analysis. Okay, back to the embryoid bodies. Um, one of the things that, you know, we always want to do with our models is try to predict, uh, you know, cases that we didn't simulate, right? So it just so happens, sort of interventions, I guess, with our models, right? It's one thing to predict the case that we're, you know, trying to emulate, but what if we go into our model system and kind of um, change things up a bit? Can we also reproduce that? 
So our, our collaborators had some data laying around from their embryoid body studies where they had actually um, treated their embryoid bodies with DAP-T, which, which is a gamma secretase inhibitor. And it basically um, increased the number of sprouts that they saw in those movies by about 60%, and that data is plotted over here. Um, it's, it's sort of you know, interfering, obviously, with that inhibition. It's basically turning off that notch delta lateral inhibition between the stock cell and the tip cells. Um, and of course, turn off the inhibition, you're going to get more sprouts. Makes sense, right? Uh, so we tried to model that, right? So we simulated DAPT very simply by um, taking that alpha parameter down to zero. We basically took notch delta interactions in our model out of the equation. And we did also see an increase in the number of sprouts or, or tip cells that, that were being uh, predicted by, by this model. Um, it was interesting that this was you know, also dependent, as we kind of established earlier, sort of tunable to the, the veg VEGF threshold against sort of the influence of that uh, stimulatory effect, and you can see that represented here. Um, but it was sort of satisfying that in this very different case, we're just you know, turning off one of the, one experimentally and computationally, one of the pieces of our model that seemed to recapitulate um, pretty well. Another thing that's useful when, and a motivator, I guess, for developing computational models and multi-scale models as well is that oftentimes you can um, predict um, outcomes that are very difficult, if not impossible, to measure uh, experimentally. And so one example is shown here. Um, we were very interested in understanding the cell-to-cell -cell heterogeneity um, with respect to VEGF receptor 2 activation. Um, it's because we think that's you know important in determining which of these cells gets to become a, a tip cell and go out and form a new vessel. And um, again, if you wanted to do this experiment empirically, I think you know I would challenge you to um, come up with a way that that, that could do it on, a, on an individual cell level. We're actually looking at you know which which receptors with a very um, fine degree of gradation are activated, and then um, also. Uh, the fact that taking this information about VEGFR2 activation and then compiling it with the effect of this VEGF gradient threshold. So not only what, what receptors are activated, but how does this threshold required for sprouting affect their influence on who can sprout. Um, now here's when we get into the, the thing our model didn't predict so well. Um, so I told you we could do sprout numbers. Basically, if you give us a, a Vicky would give us this initial network, we could just based on the architecture of that network, pretty much give a good guess at our, you know, using our model at how many sprouts would form. Now, where they would form is a totally different story. So back to this idea of false positives and true positives, right? Um, and of course, dependent on sort of where we set the threshold, obviously, with a low level of threshold, we get a, a lot more false positives, a lot more of the cells in this tissue want to sprout when we don't sort of, when we, when we lessen the, 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 the threshold required to elicit sprouting, when we sort of tighten down on the threshold, we, again, we reduce the number of false positives, we also reduce the number of true positives, right? Um, and one of the things that, uh, that came to us in terms of predicting sprout location, it's nice to have a model, again, that can not only predict how many sprouts are going to form, but also exactly where they're going to form. And um, what we realized, though, is that um, maybe our model couldn't do any better than uh, chance, right? Rolling the dice, right? Just looking at you know, these networks and saying, well, if I know there's five sprouts, just by chance, I could, you know, do a simple Monte Carlo simulation and sort of, you know, tell you, tell you where these sprouts are going to form. Um, so we wanted to test that, right? And again, this, I think, brings in the idea of using other types of models, maybe in parallel and Monte Carlo simulation, very simplified model in our case, to sort of give us a little more insight about our multi-scale model. Um, so this would be sort of a, a type one, I think, using different models to gain similar insight, but sort of getting around that in a, in, around that, um, in a very different way. So the hypothesis was that our model, um, multi-scale model, would be able to predict sprout locations better than a Monte Carlo simulation if we had few sprouts or, or few, you know, a, a lower vessel network density to begin with. But as we get up into higher and higher vessel networks, um, and more sprouts coming out of these networks as we sort of go from maybe a 60x objective to a 20 or a 10x objective, it's going to actually be quite hard for our, our computational model, our, our multi-scale model, 
um, to actually do better than a Monte Carlo simulation. And so this was kind of borne out by comparing them head to head, which I'm also a real advocate of, and I'll talk about that uh, in the final concluding slides, is if you have a multi-scale model, or any model for that matter, I think it's really worth your time, even though it takes a lot more time, to come up with another model or use somebody else's model, sort of cross-validate uh, your model. It's, it's a really important thing, and I, I think that um, it's worth every effort because it always teaches you something new about your model to do so. So here's what we learned by running a simple Monte Carlo simulation on our movies, which all had sort of different numbers, a different density of sprouts per pixel, which is represented in this graph over here. Um, we see that the deterministic probability, this is sort of the Monte Carlo probability, is linear, it does seem to be linear related, linearly related to the number of sprouts that we have in our models. And so it turns out, if we just take this movie up here, the high sprout density movie um, is shown in this, in this model, our agent-based model um, predicts um, way fewer, or significantly fewer true positives than the Monte Carlo does, right? So what this is saying is, if Vicky shows us a movie where there's a lot of sprouts, we might have to tell her, I'm sorry, our agent-based model combined with PDE model is, is really not all that useful, because we could just simulate that by chance in terms of sprout um, location and get the same result. However, we do see that at lower sprout densities, when there's fewer sprouts in that network, maybe when we're zoomed in a little bit, again, this gets back to sort of the biological scale that you're studying your system at, we do see in those cases, thankfully, uh, we couldn't just do as well with the Monte Carlo simulation. So we can't just predict that by chance, right? We actually needed those uh, interactions, the VEGF, the notch, the diffusion, all of that, you know, a detail and rigor had to be there in order to predict where these sprouts were going to happen with any degree of confidence. So I think what this speaks to, again, just to wrap up this part, is that it's really important, you know, once you build a model, to figure out what cases it's valid for, right? Because it may very well be, like in our case, that there's going to be certain examples, certain situations where that model, especially a multi-scale model, is no longer um, the best way to, to model that particular situation. Um, Okay, so um, just coming back to this slide here, you know, that, that previous model is kind of sort of in between these two. Um, I want to talk about a model now that I think sits more squarely as a type 2 model, and we're moving to big vessels for the last uh, 10 minutes or so. We're interested in hypertension, um, basically sustained elevations in systolic blood pressure and how that affects uh, vessel wall remodeling. Basically what happens, as we know, in hypertension, have high blood pressure, and your blood vessel walls get thicker over time. And so we wanted to model that. Um, it actually uh, is a really neat biological example of how mechanical forces and biochemicals sort of integrate with one another to produce this growth and remodeling response. So it's sort of a test bed to try out integration between agent-based models and more um, finite element type mechanical models. We thought this would be a good, a good place to do it. Um, so just, the, again, super simplified biology, when you have an uh, elevated um, shear stress and circumferential stress, you get um, secretion of nitric oxide, endothelial 1, PGF uh, growth factor, um, circumferential stretch uh, also increases many of these factors in addition to the matrix metalloproteases. Um, obviously, these can have effects on the cells. This is sort of sounding like Doug's talk earlier, sort of the, the molecules affecting the cells, the cells in turn affecting the environment by uh, secretion of collagen, and then obviously interactions between the various biochemicals in the environment affecting one another. So we kind of have this, you know, everything's affecting everything else sort of problem. How do we dig into it? Um, so we uh, started collaborating with Jay Humphrey, who is, I'd say, one of the world-leading experts in modeling the mechanics of large vessels uh, during growth and remodeling. Um, of course, we did our thing and developed an agent-based model based, you know, using these sort of biochemical factors and rules and, and what you would expect of an agent-based model. Our cells were able to do things, have behaviors like proliferate and produce collagen. Um, and that in turn produced a new geometry. We sort of iterated and were able to, as I'll show you in the next slide, to get a, a, our a wall to thicken. Um, Jay did the same thing. He uses uh, constitutive mixture models. Uh, again, they're sort of um, mechanics-based models that take into account um, sort of remodeling by accounting for uh, changes in composition of the vessel wall over time uh, with respect to mass balance, which is something that um, Jay likes to remind me agent-based models explicitly ignore, um, which is also a reason why we wanted to connect with Jay is because sort of the physics 
um, the theory behind these processes were much more robustly represented in the mixture model, although I will say in our defense, a lot of the biochemical behaviors and players are not even present in his model. You can kind of see where this conversation is going. It's really fun collaboration because we like to poke holes in each other's work. Um, so his model, again, based on uh, mechanical stresses, changes over time, um, cause cells to change uh, their um, production, I guess, or not really cells, but causes changes in the um, composition of the blood vessel wall. And so he's able to make predictions over time. Um, and we were actually at a point where we were sort of starting to marry our models together. We were allowing Jay's model to tell us the changes in stresses and strains in the wall, which then affected the amount of growth factor. So we started to really marry them. And very quickly we realized that we both wanted to predict the same thing. So who's right? Who's wrong? Which model works? Which one sucks? And as it turns out, um, what we decided to do was let's just have a, a face-off. Um, because we both want to predict the same thing, and neither of us wanted to concede that prediction to the other person. We said, let's just both do it, and um, here's our model. It's very simplified. Um, you know, thank goodness for blood vessel walls being sort of radially isotropic. Uh, it makes for, you know, very simple agent-based models. Um, so we got wall thickening, and you can see a lot of different outputs of our model are presented in these figures. Um, what you should note, though, so agent-based model, our, our model data is shown with the solid line. Jay's data is shown with the dashed line. And, you know, sometimes they matched okay, but a lot of times they, they didn't. And especially with respect to wall thickness, which, as I mentioned, is really the whole reason why we wanted to develop this, these models, is to understand how wall thickness changes in response to these elevated pressures and hypertension. Um, so I would say pretty bad match. I mean, ours kind of, you know, it's too slow. Wall thickness changes over time. We simulated 500 days in response to this. I think it was a 30% increase in systolic pressure. Ours is a little more slow. Jay's is a little more rapid. Um, you know, there's certain things that Jay's model could predict that ours couldn't. You know, these stresses, for example. Um, elastin was not present in our model. We really focused on collagen, so Jay had a prediction here. We didn't. Um, likewise, there were, there were outputs that Jay's model couldn't predict, like PDGF, TGF beta, that our model was capable of predicting. So again, you know, this is kind of an example where, where we said, okay, we have these two different ways to model. They can kind of talk to each other, but they also produce the same thing. Um, and, and neither one is really that good by itself. Uh, so, let's do this. Let's force our models to agree with one another. Uh, and we did that by altering 16 parameters, four in his model and um, the remaining 12 in our models. These are parameters that we determined in the sensitivity analysis. We're really influential in both of our models. That's kind of why we picked them. So we vary these parameters. Um, in order to sort of minimize an objective function that was based on some of the key outputs of our model, which was collagen composition and smooth muscle cell composition. And um, when we did this, when we forced our models to agree with one another and adjust parameters so that they would give the same output with respect to those two features, we actually got both of our cases. The models sort of converged, right? They, they sort of um, you know, got better, I guess you'd say, and, I, and I'll show you some validation data from experiments in a minute that, that further supports that. Um, but, you know, it's, it's not surprising, but what it says is that, you know, we can actually get sort of convergence these totally different models, you know, based on many cases, different experimental data, uh, we can actually get them to agree with one another. Um, we also wanted to test out the situation where we had only a 15% increase in pressure to see if it wasn't just some fluke as having a, you know, resulting from increasing our pressure by 30%. Again, we got, you know, much, much better agreement. Both models predicted uh, wall thickness a little better. And, and here's what was really cool is, is, again, sort of reinforcing the point that neither of our models was that great and we had a lot of fun arguing about whose was better. But when we married them together and altered the parameters so that they would sort of agree with one another, we actually ended up getting a prediction, uh, which in this case, because the data that's out there is, is frequently reported in this way, how many days does it take to return or re-equilibrate hoop stress as a result of this remodeling? It's been reported, you know, depending on the model and depending on the pressure increase, um, 140 to 126 days, and Jay's model by itself predicted 70 days. Our model, as I showed you before, predicted 350, nothing to brag about in either camp. But when we forced this congruency and, and made them agree, we actually were able to sort of better recapitulate um, what had been experimentally measured. 
Uh, so again, back to the sort of point where, you know, um, the models don't necessarily have to feed back and forth in a really um, tightly integrated way to be informative and instructive for um, understanding the biology and reproducing the biology in an experimentally relevant manner. Um, so just to wrap up with the last few minutes, and I'll leave some time for questions, I think I like this sort of metaphor. Um, and forgive me, I'm a mom, and I spend a lot of time in sandboxes and on playgrounds, too. So computational models are really sandboxes for exploration. exploration. Um, Multi-scale models, I think, though, are really entire playgrounds. Um, as long as we know our limits and as long as we sort of reach out and try to appropriately synergize with other types of models. Um, and that's represented here by um, knowing your limits. I think as a mom, I look at this picture and that terrifies me. I think she's most likely to go to the ER. Uh, and then likely the synergy represented down here, sort of we both can um, work together. These models at different scales can really work together to get a deeper understanding of the biology and become better models too as a, as a byproduct. Um, so the uh, sort of the take home message um, specific to uh, I think really any multi-scale model, not just this one, um, is that multi-scale models can really predict dynamic events over time, which is what growth and remodeling is. Um, they can kind of give insight into necessary and sufficient mechanisms. Uh, we can tune, we can understand how various factors can be tuned and how the tuning of one factor will affect the tuning of the other factor, back to the coarse grain, fine grain focus analogy that I was talking about in the context of the embryoid body model. Um, we can get, you know, the appreciation of sensitivity, uh, which I think is instructive for, you know, understanding how combination therapies could work together and compensate for one another. Um, and then the idea of, you know, adding layers of complexity, you know, gradually over time is something that multi-scale modeling is really suited to. And I think my only word of caution would be if you start out to build a multi-scale model, it is um, helpful to start simple <laughs> and then expect that you will add detail later on um, because these things get big and slow very quickly uh, in our experience. Um, with that, I'd like to acknowledge um, Joe again. Um, Vicki and John, her uh, postdoc, who uh, has recently accepted a faculty position just up the road at the uh, Curlian Health System. Um, so it's exciting that he's going to be moving back to the better state. Um, and Phelan, again, at Johns Hopkins. So with that, I'll take any questions. Uh, beautiful. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in how you're thinking about I don't even want to call it stochasticity because I don't think it's that, but instantiations or just individuals. So two sides of it, the computation and the experimental side. On the computational side, do you need to run multiple simulations or you don't really because it's not really a stochastic model? I mean, once you let your agent-based model run, all your tool rules are deterministic, just one run ought to do it. Okay. But then on the other hand, if you had seven movies, are you trying to match each movie separately? Are there different parameters or properties for each movie? <coughs> are there some features that on the average then are that are consensus features and insights? You know, how do you think about the actual individual runs right. on both sides? So with our agent-based models, you know, and you're right, you can make a totally deterministic agent-based model. Oftentimes our models will have some amount of stochasticity. So the rules themselves will have an inherent sort of probability. Like nine times out of 10, if uh, that threshold of VEGF gets reached, then that sprout will go out and become a tip if the inhibition state is, you know, what it should be. Um, so, so most of our models do have that. I mean, I always like stochasticity in general because I think it is more representative of the bio biological variation that we see from movie to movie to movie. But I think it depends, you know, what your overarching question is, whether or not you need to include that. Because for us, do we care if movie one and movie two from a wild type embryoid body are different or the same? Not really. What we're really interested in is sort of the DAPT case, which I, I should have mentioned. So that's kind of like in a tumor, maybe, where you have a lot more sprouting going on, right? Sort of a pathological case. And so then I think that, you know, the sort of noise of the population of the wild type is, you know, you know, kind of important, but what's what's more important is is how different that is from what's going on in a pathological setting where there's, you know, also obviously there's noise and then maybe even more noise in, in that particular case. So from that point of view then, it's less important to fit 
a number of different individual cases under one condition. Mm -hmm. And more important to get that kind of roughly yeah. right. And then, and then really have the right insights to predict uh, the effect of something that's really quite different. Yeah, I think that's more useful, you know, to be honest with you. I mean, I'm like you, bioengineers who want to solve problems. And when this goes awry in the retina, you know, why is that? Is it like when it goes awry in a tumor? You know, or are there subtleties that are important? And yeah, I think that's just where my heart is. And yeah. I think that's more uh, translational. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah, thanks. Other questions for Shane? Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you for a fantastic talk. Um, in the first model, the agent-based model, I'm curious about how you chose how many points on the cell membrane to model, because that, was it fixed? Does it change depending on the, the um, size of the cell? I'm so glad you asked that question. I have been um, badgering Joe to go and make this model with four nodes, six nodes, 16 nodes. Um, originally, that decision kind of came out of conversations with Phelan, because in his deterministic ODPD, you know, mass action kinetics models, he's, um, we, we had to figure out a way to put that information into a certain number of nodes, right? We had to sort of average it, right? Or divide across the membrane. And so it came out of those kind of conversations. What was really like practical, computational tractable, what, what's a good number to divide by? I got, you know, it's stupid um, conversations like that that lead to these decisions that can be really important. And I agree with you, the way to test it, you know, is it just, uh, you know, is, is it going to be different if we only have four? The other, the other piece is, you know, we wanted more than three because, you know, cells don't really look like triangles. And, and we're, we're trying to um, collaborate with another group that does models of shape changes of these endothelial cells during angiogenesis. And so we wanted to have at least enough resolution so that our cells weren't too pixelated to be able to collaborate with her. Her name is Katie Bentley. She does really nice work in this area, too, using agent-based models. I'm remiss not to mention her work if anyone's interested in this. But... Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, we kind of said, it makes sense, let's try, let's try eight. I think we did try six. Um, I've asked Joe to try 16, and he, he's not doing it for some reason. Uh, I think it's because it's going to take forever, but we're running these on, you know, 16 node clusters now, so I keep telling him you can do it in his sleep. But it's a, it's a great comment, and I think it speaks to the, the larger issue of how you make these decisions, right, which at the time are seemingly insignificant, but when you're trying to re reproduce the biology, you know, kind of, well, it looks about right, or, you know, we can capture different shapes with eight, so let's stick to that as a start. That's kind of, that's where that came from. Thank you. Yes. Have you thought about adding other biological indicators, such as something that can indicate the membrane morphology or changes in the protein within clusters? That can probably be induced because of the other media that you have in there and causing the extension of the cells to help the models yeah, so I think you're talking about really the shape, again, the shape of those cells and adding more, um, so, like Philopodia, for example? Right, so like if, you, if you add an indicator, I'm just thinking randomly, if you add an indicator, uh, some kind of recorder on the membrane, and then thus, you, when you add in the substrate, and it will cause the changes in the membrane morphology, and then more the, the protein expression, thus it will trigger the response of sprouting. And this can, can help you identify other parameters to add into the equation. Yeah, that's a really cool. That's a really cool idea. Um, and uh, we haven't thought of doing that. Um, there's a number of different types of manipulations you can do in this sort of uh, embryoid body model. Um, so it might be feasible there. Um, in terms of sort of uh, looking with that level of granularity, we've kind of just more looked at. You know, standing back sort of that morphological, are, are you looking like you're going to be a tip and not the level of detail of, you know, what's going on across a single cell membrane. Um, but it would be cool to think about different reporters. A GFP, um, obviously that's cytosolic. Um, but, you know, you can, uh, I think um, Vicki's got tools now where she has reporters that, you know, coherence and junctional proteins where you can actually see more of the um, cell borders. Yeah. One final question before we break anything. Hey, thanks, Shane. Thanks.